Welcome back, everyone. Today, we are going to be talking about determining the minimum and maximum values of a quadratic equation. And we're going to talk about doing that in a whole bunch of different ways, not just if we have a vertex form equation. One thing I want to mention first is that uh, when it comes to finding the minimum or maximum values, there's two important things is that the K value is the actual minimum or maximum value. So when we do have a vertex form equation, we automatically know the answer. We know, oh, it's the K value and that's it. You're done. Right. However, uh, how we're going to learn today about how can we actually make something that is not in that form to be that form or how can we find or what's another method of, in some cases, finding that K value, that minimum or maximum value without um, without actually going to vertex form. So we'll discuss all of that today. Also, you might wonder, well, how do we know whether there's a minimum or a maximum and can there be both? Well, if you picture a quadratic or a parabola, no, there can't be both. Every quadratic either has a minimum value or a maximum value, but not both, right? Uh, if the parabola opens up, right, then we have a minimum value. We have the, it starting low down or at some point, doesn't have to be low down, but some point and going up right? So therefore, there's a minimum value. Now, if the parabola opens down, it's the opposite. We have a maximum value and every other point is below it. So either we have a minimum or a maximum, depending if it opens up or down, right? So basically, if the a value, so that very first number in front of our quadratic after the y equals sign, if it's positive, that means that it opens up and we have a minimum. And if it's negative, that means it opens down and we have a maximum. So that's how to know is our min slash max value, like which one is it? Because sometimes you'll be asked that too. You won't just be asked to find the optimal value or the min or max value. You'll be asked which one are you finding? Is it a minimum value that you're you're telling us or is it a maximum value that you're giving us, right? Uh, so, so let's get into it. Let's do that. So it does mention here there's two ways to find the minimum or maximum value of a quadratic. We're going to get into the first one, which is examining a quadratic equation in vertex form. Often completing the square is required. So completing the square, that's the method to change something from uh, standard form into vertex form. So sometimes it's not obvious what where the vertex is, but by changing the equation into a vertex form equation, we're able to get there. So let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, let's start with this example where it says graph this equation and find the minimum or maximum value and where it occurs. Uh, so for example, for this one, we know that our h comma k is negative is sorry is three comma negative four. So therefore, that's right here. And we're just going to do our regular over one up one over two up four pattern. Oh, and if you're unfamiliar, if you're unfamiliar with the graphing this, uh, there is a, an entire video on that. So go check that out if you haven't already. It's a lesson two in the series uh, one, if you're interested in that. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's draw our parabola like that. And we can tell from the graph and also from, um, you know, just this equation that the minimum uh, or maximum value, in this case, it is a minimum value clearly because it opens up, you know, and our a value is, is, is positive here, right? I don't see a negative sign. So therefore our max or sorry, our minimum value, our minimum value is y equals to negative four, right? That's our k value. So our, our y coordinate of the vertex. And it occurs, and it occurs, so it always occurs at the x coordinate of the vertex or axis of symmetry, which in this case is three. So, and it occurs at x equals to three. Very good. Oh, and as always, if you have questions about any of this, drop me a comment, please, and thank you. I'd appreciate that very much. Uh, okay. For the equation, uh, y equals x squared plus 8x plus 13. Complete the square to find the minimum or maximum value and where it occurs. 
Okay, so for this one, it says to complete the square, and we haven't really done that yet in this course, at least. You know, I haven't explained before how to do this. So before we actually get into the question, I'm going to explain what are the steps to completing the square. So step one, step one is that if there is a leading coefficient, if there is a leading coefficient, factor it out of the first two terms. Now in this case, there is no leading coefficient well other than one, so we actually can skip this step. So we won't actually do this this time, but I did want to put it as one of the steps because it is crucial if there is a leading coefficient and to check for that first. So in this case, don't worry about it. Sometimes it'll occur though. Okay, number two. Step two is to um, find the b over 2 squared value. Okay, so what do I mean by the b over 2 squared value? Well, you know how every equation we have y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So b is the coefficient of our x. So in this case, it's 8. So we would find 8 over 2 and then square that value. So we would find what that is. Uh, so let's do that. Let's actually, let's do it as I explain the steps. So 8 over 2 squared is 4 squared, which is 16. So we did step 2. We found it. Very good. Number 3 is to add and subtract. Add and subtract the result. And what I mean by result, I'm going to be more clear, the b over 2 squared value in the equation. Okay, so our original equation is y equals x squared plus 8x plus 13. What if I add 16 and subtract 16? So I'm going to do that. x squared plus 8x plus 16 minus 16 and then plus 13. Okay, so what you'll notice is I didn't actually change the equation. I just added zero plus 16 minus 16. Well, that could I could cancel that out. We could get zero right now. We could go back to the original equation. Now, we're not going to do that because that would defeat the purpose of all these steps we're taking. But my point is we could, right? We could. We're not actually changing our equation. We're just changing the form of the equation here, which is our goal, right? We want to find, uh, we don't want to find the min or max for a different parabola. We want to find it for this one, but we need to change the form to do that. So I did want to point out that our equation doesn't actually change here. Just the format of the equation changes here. That's all that changes. Okay, and let's do step four, which is factor the first three terms. And collect like terms, which I guess is two things, so we can kind of do it all in one. Okay, so factor the first three terms. So the thing is, there's always a specific way to factor these first three terms because they're always going to be that perfect square method mm -hmm. of factoring, right? Recall, recall that, that a plus b squared is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, right? So it's always going to be this pattern every single time. That's why we found the b over 2 squared value was so that we could guarantee that every time it will follow this pattern. So not only do we factor the first three terms, we always factor them using this. So I'm going to do that a, or not a, sorry, uh, x plus 4 squared is factoring the first three terms. And then when I say collect like terms, I just mean this negative 16 and 13. We can collect those and just get negative 3 at the end there. So negative 3 is there. So therefore, what did we learn from this? We completed the square. We now know that the, um, the maximum or minimum value, in this case, the minimum value, because, you know, we have a positive sign here, right? We have a positive leading coefficient for our a, so we know it's, that therefore it is a minimum. That therefore the minimum value 
is our k value, right? So y equals negative 3. And it occurs at x equals 2, negative 4. Right? And you might wonder, and a, lot, a common question I get asked a lot of times from students is, how come it's negative 4? I see a plus 4. And that's true. But keep in mind that our original factored form equation, sorry, not factored form, vertex form equation looks like this. It's y equals x minus h squared plus k, right, with the a in front as well, possibly, right? We possibly have an a value that isn't 1 necessarily. So in this case here, we have a negative there, right? So if we have a positive here, then the h value itself is actually negative, right? Because we would have negative and then a second negative inside the h that would make it positive. Whereas, let's say it's negative, let's say it's x minus 3, for example, in here. Well, then it would be positive 3 because the negative is not part of the 3, right? The negative is just part of the equation, right? So that's one way to think of it is that there's always a negative there. Another way you could think of it is just that um, it's always the opposite of, of what you would imagine uh, that it is. So that's that's something I get asked a lot. So I thought I would, I would mention that here. But as always, if you do have any questions, uh, leave those down in the comments. I do check the comments. Okay, uh, let's move on to another one. For the equation uh, y equals 3x squared minus 12x plus 24, complete the square to find the minimum and maximum value and where it occurs. Now, normally it's at this point that I would encourage you to pause the video and try it for yourself, and you can if you'd like to. This one does have, this one is, is different enough though that if you don't want to do that, that's perfectly valid as well because, um, you know, there is an extra step here, which is step one that we didn't do before. If we recall, step one was if there is a leading coefficient, factor it out of the first two terms. And I didn't have to do that last time, and this time I need to do that. So let's do it. Uh, y equals 3, uh, oh, sorry, 3x, oh no, sorry, just the leading coefficient, 3x squared minus 4x plus 24. So all I've done here is just factored out that 3. Okay, uh, then the next step is to take that B value, which in this case, we're going to uh, imagine the B value is just this four, right? That just this negative four and not, doesn't have to be multiplied by the three. So keep that in mind too. Even though technically the B value is negative 12, we're going to pretend as though it's negative four because that's what's actually in our brackets. We factored out the three. So let's do that. Uh, so, uh, negative 4 over 2 squared is equal to negative 2 squared, which is equal to 4. So we're going to add and subtract 4 in those brackets. So this is equal to 3x squared minus 4x plus 4 minus 4 plus 24. Then our next step is we're going to factor the first three terms. So we're going to factor these terms. And then this term, something very important I want to mention about the negative 4, a lot of people will just remove it from the brackets and put it out here. But we can't do that. In order for the negative 4 to leave the brackets, it must be multiplied by, by this 3 in order to do that. So we're actually going to have 3 times x minus 2 squared, right, to factor, to follow that pattern that I talked about earlier. Then we're going to have 3 times negative 4, which is negative 12, and then plus 24 tacked on the end. A common mistake I see is just minus 4 plus 24. No, always make sure that when you uh, factor something out for the leading coefficient, that that negative 4, whatever that number is, gets multiplied before it leaves. That's its exit pass, if you will, for it to leave. Okay, so then our answer is... 3 times x minus 2 squared plus 12. So therefore, our minimum value, or the minimum value, is 12, and it occurs at x equals 2. And just a reminder, it's 2 and not negative 2, because the negative is part of the equation, so it's only the 2 that's the actual h value. So therefore, it is indeed positive 2. That was not a typo. All right, uh, very good. Very, very good. 
This next one is very similar. It's, I mean, they gave it in word problem form, but in terms of the actual method of solving, it's the exact same as the last ones that we just did. Uh, so let's do it. It says, if a flight of a flying squirrel is given by this equation, where the time in seconds and the h is in meters, the height is in meters, find the maximum height of the squirrel and the time that it occurs. So this time they did kind of give away that it's maximum height, but at the same time, you know, maybe it didn't take a lot for us to know that, right? We, we see right here that A is a negative value, so it must be the maximum height. And also, too, you know, the flying squirrel is flying everywhere or an airplane's flying or whatever it is, minimum height wouldn't make a lot of sense, right? Because technically minimum height of anything like that you would think you would think is zero, right? That it's not flying at all is the minimum. Whereas maximum, that could vary, right? Maybe this flying squirrel can fly higher than I can, but not higher than the airplane or the bird, for example, right? I don't know, but that's just a guess, right? Different animals or different um, structures or whatever it is, they can be higher. They can have a maximum height that's higher than, um, you know, than other things. Right? Whereas minimum height, you know, usually that's just, the ground, you know, unless we're digging underground for some reason. Uh, good. So let's, uh, let's do it. Let's use the same method as before to figure this out. So first things first, I'm just going to rewrite the equation that they have given us here. And then I'm going to do step one from earlier, which was to factor out the first, uh, the leading coefficient. So let's do that. Negative 0.5 x squared minus 12, we'll say, uh, or 12x rather, minus 11. Then I will do 12 over 2 squared, right, our b over 2 squared value, and get 6 squared, which is 36. So this, this is step 2. Step 3 is to go back here and to add and subtract that inside our brackets. x squared minus 12x uh, plus 36 minus 36 minus 11. And remembering that this minus 36 needs to be multiplied by the 0.5 for it to leave the brackets. So then we're going to do step four, which is to collect like terms and also to multiply or sorry, not multiply to factor the first three terms in our brackets. So we still have negative 0.5 out here. Then we have x minus six squared. And then we have minus 11, and we also have 36, or minus 36 rather, times negative 0 0.5, which is plus 18. And then I guess this is still step four because I didn't actually combine like terms. I just wrote out what the like terms are that we need to combine. So I'm gonna do another step for step four and actually combine them and get seven. Good. So therefore, the maximum height is seven meters and it occurs after six, positive six by the way, seconds. And there's our answer. Very good. So we've, so far we've only really done one method of finding the minimum or maximum value. Basically we have either had something in vertex form, we've just quickly glanced at it and known the answer, or we have put something that is in standard form into vertex form in order to manipulate it to do what we want it to do and to give us the information that we would like to know about it. Uh, however, we haven't talked about you know, what, what's the second method, right? I mentioned there were two methods, so what's the second method we could do that? The second method is if we have something in factor form or if we're willing to factor, we are able to figure it out that way, okay? So here it asks, um, for the equation, uh, negative 2x squared plus 4x plus 16, use factoring to find the x-intercepts and use the vertex to find the minimum and maximum value and where it occurs. So in this case, we can actually find the zeros, right? We already talked about finding the zeros using the zero product property. Whenever we have zeros that are um, that are available, and but what, what what I didn't mention there is that uh, if you take the average of the zeros, assuming there are zeros that exist, which not all 
quadratics have zeros, but let's say a quadratic does. Every quadratic that does have zeros, we always take the average of those zeros, and we can get the axis of symmetry, which is also the x-coordinate of the vertex, and we can then plug in that value to the original equation to find the y-coordinate of the vertex, which also is the minimum or maximum value. So that's another way we can do it. So for questions like this, step one is to fully factor. Step two is to find the zeros. And this would be using the zero product property. In the very first video ever in the series, we talk about using the zero product property. So if you're not familiar with that, go check that out. Uh, number three, after we find the zeros, is to find the average of the zeros. So find h, right, which is the average of the zeros. And there's only ever two zeros, or one zero technically is possible too. So this is also the average of zeros and axis of symmetry. And then number four is to sub h. Sub h equals, not, does not equals, sub h equals to x to find, or I guess I should say x equals h to find the min or max value, right? To find that k value. Okay, so that's the, that's the goal here, right? So I'm gonna talk one more time about, well, why would this method work? And also when would this method not work? Because this method does not always work. The other method I actually prefer, even though it's you know maybe a bit more tedious because it does always guaranteed work. So this one, uh, works because whenever we have two zeros or really any two points that are equidistant on our um, on our quadratic, right? We're able to take that information, find the average of those x values, and that gives us our x of symmetry. And the zeros are no exception. If we find that, we find the x coordinate of the vertex, and then from there we can easily find the y coordinate of the vertex moving forward, right? So that's pretty straightforward, which is really nice. Uh, okay. So given that, um, oh, and also I should mention, when does this not work? So this does not work for, for uh, quadratics that don't have any zeros. So if a quadratic is not factorable at all, or it does not have any zeros, this does not work. So whenever you see an equation already in factored form, you know for sure that this, this would work because it can be factored if it's already in factored form. However, if it's in standard form like this one, we don't always know. Right? What if I couldn't factor this? How do I use this method? Well, I can't use this method. I have to use the other method if I would like to find my min or max value. Right? And this goes back to the idea, too, that all quadratics always have a vertex form and always have a standard form. Because every quadratic does have a y-intercept and every quadratic does have a vertex but not every quadratic has a zero or x-intercept, and therefore factored form is not a possible form for all quadratics. There are some quadratics that have no factored form, and those are the quadratics that do not have any solutions, x-intercepts, uh, zeros, whatever you like to call them, right? By the way, x-intercepts, zeros, and solutions all mean the same thing. Uh, okay, so let's get on to actually doing it. Let's stop stalling here. Y is equal to, uh, well, it's common factor first, x squared minus 2x minus 8, which is equal to, let's see, well, what are two things that multiply to negative 8 and add up to negative 2? Let's see, uh, maybe 4 and 2. Oh, yeah, that works. That sounds good. Negative 4 times 2 and then negative 4 plus 2, that will work. So x minus 4, x plus 2. Good. Okay, so now we have to find the zeros. This, all of this was step one. Step two is to find the zeros. So that's gonna be x is four and x equals negative two. And I'll briefly explain how I got those numbers. Uh, basically, if when we're finding the zeros, we want we know that if any anything we're multiplying together with anything else is zero, the whole thing is zero, right? If I have negative two times zero times a bunch of other stuff, it's all just zero. Right? As soon as we multiply a 0 or into our equation, 
the whole thing is zero. It, it ruins the whole thing or makes the whole thing how we want it, in other words, right? Depending on how we look at it. Uh, and so in this case, I chose 4 and negative 2 for the zeros because if we plug in 4 to this equation, we get 4 minus 4 as one of the things we're multiplying and that's 0. And 0 times negative 2 times whatever the other bracket is, is just 0. And likewise, for our third bracket here, if I plug in negative 2, we just get negative 2 plus 2, which is 0. 0 times the other stuff, I don't even care what the other stuff is, is just 0. Right. So again, if that's a, a concept that's uh, confusing, do watch the very first video of the series where we talk about the zero product property, because that's all I, I'm going to say on it for this video specifically. Um, let's try number three, which is find H, which is the average of the zero. So three H is equal to four plus negative two divided by two, which is two over two, which is one. Right. So one. Then we need to find k. We need to sub x equals h, or in this case, sub x equals 1, right? Because h is equal to 1, we just found it. y equals negative 2 times 1 squared plus 4 times 1 plus 16, which is equal to negative 2 plus 4 plus 16, which is equal to 18. So our y value is 18, or I guess we could even call this our k value, right? We could, we could say this is k our minimum or maximum. Now in this case, uh, it must be a maximum because the parabola opens down, right? We have a negative sign in front, so that means it must be a maximum. So therefore the max value is 18. And it occurs at x equals to 1. Good. All right, uh, let's do another one like this. Here it says for this equation, uh, y equals 2x squared plus 4x minus 30. Use factoring to find the x-intercepts and then use the vertex to find the min and max value and where it occurs. And this is our last question for today. So if you got tired, don't worry. This is our last one. I encourage you to pause the video. Give this a try if you're comfortable doing that. Um, and then come on back when you're ready to uh, have this taken up. All right, so it's been possibly some time, possibly no time at all, but let's get into it. Uh, so y is equal to 2 uh, x squared plus 2x minus 15 is my first step. My second step is to factor this and say what are two things that multiply to negative 15 but add up to 2. And those are, of course, negative 5 and, or sorry, positive 5 and negative 3. Right? So y equals 2 times x minus 3, x plus 5. So to find the zeros, this is step 1. Find the zeros is step 2. x is 3 and x is negative 5. Step 3 is to find the h value, right? So to find the average of those two zeros, so that's going to be 3 minus 5 over 2, which is negative 2 over 2, which is negative 1. Then sub, sub x equals 2 h which is negative 1 in this case so y equals 2 negative 1 squared plus 4 negative 1 minus 30 or we could even say k is equal to this it, you know let's do that actually I, I like that better um so k is equal to 2 minus 4 minus 30 which is negative 32. And in this case, we have a positive leading coefficient. It's positive 2. So therefore, it's a minimum value, not a maximum value. So therefore, the min value is negative 32. And it occurs at x equals 2. Negative. Okay, so that's everything for today. If you do have any questions, please leave them down in the comments, and we'll see you next day. Bye.